I've said that there are six major audio issues that stand between listeners and a level of believability and engagement that parallels or even improves upon the live experience. The Berkeley Alpha DAC reference addresses one of these major issues, that of amusical or non-musical digital distortions, and it does this more effectively than any DAC I've heard. Okay, I like to start with the elephant in the room. So yes, this DAC is expensive. The Berkeley Alpha DAC Reference Series 3 is priced at $28,000 in the US. That's an expensive DAC. And if you're of the worldview that nothing that expensive can be worth it because it's outside your budget, well, I can understand. I'll also say that if it passes the show me better for less test, then it could be a reasonable purchase for well-heeled audiophiles. I don't know whether it passes that test, but I want to find out and I will be reviewing other contenders as soon as I can. I wanted to start this project by looking for DACs that are more than a hair's breadth better than others. But beyond helping your shopping, there are other items of interest raised by the Berkeley Alpha DAC that make it a benchmark of sorts. So again, here are two sentences about the Alpha DAC if you're in a hurry but I hope you'll stay tuned. Robert summarizes with, the reference DAC exquisitely reveals musical detail, but in a way that doesn't call attention to itself. Rather, the presentation is densely textured and infused with a wealth of the finest microstructure of instrumental dynamic, timbral, and spatial cues. Now, you might wanna listen to that one again, cause that's a complex sentence. I invite you to read Robert Harley's review of the Alpha DAC Reference Series 3 on the Absolute Sound website. It doesn't address the issues I cover here, but it does explain why this DAC is held in high regard. There's a link in the description. All right, what problem are we trying to solve? That's always a great place to start. Here's where the conversation gets interesting for listeners willing to think about how we really improve the audio experience. My assertion is that most audio progress is organized to yield small, incremental advances in parameters where the products are already high performing. This, I suspect, is because engineering is organized around problems we know how to work on. And so we do. Over a period of 10 years or so, the resulting incremental progress adds up, and you can buy a much better DAC or speakers or preamp than you could a decade ago. But in this model I'm outlining, I suggest that after 50 to 75 years of work, we've passed a threshold with standard distortions wherein incremental advances don't make for a much better sounding stereo. They make for a better sounding stereo, but it isn't much better. And yet, there remain six big problems that are sitting there damping the believability of the musical experience, but which don't fit inside the standard engineering model and thus aren't progressing very quickly. This, I think, is why many listeners can hear a $300,000 stereo and a $30,000 stereo and ask seriously whether the $300,000 rig is that much better. By way of analogy, incremental advances on the standard dimensions get you a better car, not an airplane. And we need airplanes to address the issues of believability and engagement. Now, I said that there are six major above threshold problems with music reproduction that stand in the way of believability. These are the problem of recording standards, the problem of visual images, the problem of spatial imaging, the problem of bass in real rooms, the problem of dynamics, and the problem of amusical digital distortions. These are tough issues because they don't seem to lend themselves to traditional work on frequency response or distortion levels or noise at the component level. Don't misunderstand, those are all worthwhile endeavors, and I certainly wouldn't have predicted 15 years ago how much there was to be gained by working on noise. So I hope that such work continues. But I assert we should understand the kinds of goals we're pursuing and the kind we're not pursuing and set our expectations accordingly. In the interest of getting closer to believable music reproduction, a different kind of project that I invite you to follow is a search for DACs that address problem number six, the above threshold amusical distortions of digital. Because the problem has been around for a while, 
since 1982 when the compact disc first came out, really. I'll consider DACs that are and aren't brand new. The Alpha DAC, for example, dates from 2019. But, think about this, if Moore's Law and newness alone could solve the problem of digital distortions, then it wouldn't be on the list. As it happens, the Alpha DAC convinced me that it was possible to make progress on amusical digital distortions and thus make more than incremental progress on believability. And so, our journey begins. The new Estelon XB Diamond Mark II. Estelon's innovative engineering concepts integrate the loudspeaker with the room and its acoustics, building upon newly advanced cabinet and driver systems. The result? The XB Diamond Mark II delivers an emotionally involving listening experience, fully revealing the soundstage and musical details of any recording. Look for a review of the XB Diamond Mark II in an upcoming issue of The Absolute Sound. All right, a little bit more on amusical digital distortions. We should first say that digital signals have many advantages, but I will assert that the continued interest in vinyl playback for high-end audio suggests that there is still something wrong with much of the digital playback we experience. I've asked a lot of experienced listeners to try to explain what they like about vinyl or what disturbs them about digital, and they generally have to point vaguely at the problem. I may do no better, but as a first point, I want to say that when knowledgeable music lovers and audiophiles prefer a medium, I'm talking about vinyl here, that has massively inferior distortion, crosstalk, frequency response, and noise levels, an open-minded person would see that as a data point suggesting some kind of digital error is still prevalent and meaningfully problematic. Digital processing can be handicapped by artifacts that are unlike those we're accustomed to in the analog world. This is a problem. My point here is that digital artifacts can occur even though viewing them through analog style metrics shows that the digital signals crush the performance of pure analog. Examples of digital artifacts, just so you know what I'm talking about, would include aliasing difference errors where high frequency sounds at lower sampling frequencies can, with downstream nonlinearities, generate signals in the upper mid-range or lower treble, not in the original music. Another one is pre-ringing, wherein partial musical sounds during playback occur before, before in time, they occur in the main recording due to A to D errors. Think about that one if you want to blow your mind. Another one is side tones, where certain types of input signals trigger output sounds not in the original signal due to math errors in the D to A process. Another one is clipping due to intersample overloads. Again, those are examples of where digital might go wrong. Some of these errors require specific input signals and thus can be hard to measure with certain standardized test signals. More important though for listeners is that a somewhat consistent aspect of known digital distortions is their amusical character. To summarize, if digital processing adds a signal, we can call this noise if you like, but note that this isn't typical analog noise like hiss, and if that noise is correlated to the music, related to the music in level and timing, it will tend to make the music sound odd or wrong. If the noise is not correlated to the music, the ear will have an easier time ignoring the result. I didn't say easy, I said an easier time. Ideally, we'd have neither uncorrelated noise nor correlated noise, but correlated noise is a real problem. So, I want to repeat, correlated noise can be difficult to hear explicitly because it's embedded in the music signal. But if you know what real music sounds like, you know that reproduced music with correlated noise is wrong. The noise bothers you. The noise is a distraction. The noise reduces the sense of believability. You may not know why, you won't hear it explicitly, but you know something is wrong. Let me give you some examples. I notice this uncorrelated noise, again, not explicitly, but in the frequently awful high frequency sounds on digital recordings. Cymbal strikes are often problematic, where I regularly hear a harsh, crashy, piercing tone even when the cymbal isn't struck violently. 
kind of sounds like... <laughs> Sorry if you're wearing headphones. Violin often doesn't sound right either when rendered by digital. With violins, the tone with digital tends to be monochromatic, unlike the real deal. Some female vocals can be problematic as well, as can some piano. The telltale elements are thin, imbalanced harmonics. But I think this analytical language can be a little bit misleading. The big deal is the, the music sounds wrong, and that's distracting, encouraging a focus on the audio, not on the music, which is not where we want the focus. As you may have guessed, I'm taking you through all this because the Berkeley Alpha DAC reference has these distortions to a much lower degree than other DACs I've had in my reference system. This isn't to say the Alpha DAC eliminates such distortions. With multiple artifact types and the possibility of distortions introduced in the recording itself, this is a multi-dimensional problem. One example of the Berkeley's distortion reduction comes from the Black Puma's first album. On the song Colors, there's extensive cymbal work along with upper range choral singing. I listened to this track on an embedded AKM DAC, a 4493, a topping D70 Pro with ESS9038 DAC chips, the DCS Lena with Master Clock, and on the Alpha DAC. I tried a variety of filter and mapping settings when these were available. All the standalone DACs were fed by an Orinder N200 streamer via USB, which meant the Alpha DAC had the outboard Berkeley Alpha USB Series 2 box. All the DACs aside from the Alpha DAC have some noticeable distortion on the difficult passages on this Black Pumas album. Remember, this is just one example from among many. This leads to a sharpness of treble tones and makes cymbals and choral sounds more homogenized than they would be in real life. The other DACs didn't all sound the same by any means. The Lena being maybe halfway between the chip-based DACs and the Berkeley and the chip-based DACs aren't the same. But they all, save the Berkeley, had distortions of the type I'm describing. I want to expand on this a bit to help you understand what we're talking about, but flipping the perspective to how digital sounds when it's done better, meaning more believably. With the Alpha DAC, these treble sounds seem to be unpacked in the sense that what sounds like a single transient tone on the other DACs is revealed by the Alpha DAC to be multiple tones and harmonics. The Alpha DAC presents these slightly spread out in time so that each tone or overtone can be heard, as is the case with real instruments. With the Alpha DAC, fundamentals, harmonics, and body resonances all have their own place in the mix. I heard this Alpha DAC strength clearly on Hilary Hahn's 2023 high res recording of the Isai Sonatas for Violin. I could clearly hear the fundamentals, overtones, and violin body as a rich harmonic structure rather than a stripped-down sequence of tones. As luck would have it, just before DAC Overload Week, I had invited a violinist friend into my new listening room to hear what the real thing sounds like, and a standout quality of the real thing was this time dimensionality of different notes she was playing. For another perspective, John Vallon, one of our reviewers, has a complementary view about normal digital, which, when inverted, applies to the Alpha DAC. John says, tone colors should be developed with a lifelike duration, yielding timbral density, and maintaining dimensionality at a 3D level. The Berkeley does this on many recordings. Expanding on the idea, I observed that the other DACs I used for this review can seem to be brighter than the Alpha DAC. I think this is not due to frequency response issues. It's due to the addition of distortion components that attract extra attention from the ear, especially in the treble. The Alpha DAC doesn't generate that distortion or as much distortion, and it reveals the timing of the underlying components. It has as much total treble musical energy, but the energy is slightly spread out in time and doesn't seem as over-energized. A big point here is that you won't solve these digital distortion problems with tone shaping. You might ameliorate them, but you won't solve them. With the Alpha DAC, I got a lesson in treble balance versus treble distortion. Listening to Limits of Language by Field Music, for example, I noted that I felt the mixing and mastering was on the bright side. This was something I noticed right away. But a few moments later, I noted that with the Alpha DAC, this treble balance wasn't really bothersome. 
I realized I'd learned to instinctively recoil from tipped up treble balance, you might be able to relate, because I associated this with amplified digital artifacts that distract and annoy. They, at least they annoy me. With the Alpha DAC, a different treble balance is more like changing your seating position in a concert hall, where closer positions tend to have more treble, yet you don't live in fear of row E versus row J. They just sound a bit different. These richer tone colors aren't confined to the treble. Mid-range on the Alpha DAC seems richer too, although you might notice this only by comparison, and depth is improved, in some cases, quite substantially. Oddly, this bothered me at least, bass definition on the Alpha DAC also seems slightly better than I'm used to. That seems weird to me, but I know that many reviewers have reported that super tweeters can have a primary effect in the bass, so I try to retain an open mind. I wouldn't say the bass definition benefits of the Alpha DAC are significant enough to be anything more than icing on the cake, but many people like frosting. Who am I to judge? All right, with all of these significant comments about the Alpha DAC, you might want a little bit of technical background. So let me give you some idea of what might be causing these results, but as you may know if you've listened to my other reviews, I really don't think you can completely reason from technology to sound, but it, it feels good. Berkeley Audio Design is a long-established company offering its first DAC in 2008, but with a digital processing history extending back to Pacific Microsonics and the development of HDCD in the 1990s. They're notoriously tight-lipped about the technology in the reference DAC. They do say it's a multi-bit design, but so are the vast majority of modern DACs. They seem very concerned about clock accuracy, but they also emphasize that many design decisions require unusual approaches to get timing and noise to the lowest possible levels. An example of this is using assembly language instead of a high-level language for key onboard software. Isolation of signals from noise sources and careful management of the thermal environment Alpha DAC weighs 30 pounds largely to stabilize the interior thermal environment, are also examples of attention to detail. Berkeley places great emphasis on listening tests, and in my discussions with them, they repeatedly brought up examples of design goals that had been established during their entire history starting in the mid-1990s based on revelations from listening experiments. If you like science, you gotta like these guys. They seem quite clear that the human ear and brain can perceive things that you might not expect and that these perceptual capabilities must be the guiding force behind design work. All right, if you lasted this long, let's summarize. The Berkeley Alpha DAC Reference Series 3 is the first DAC I've heard that crosses the threshold where amusical digital distortions are significantly reduced as an important distraction. This is a big achievement in my view, as I think I've explained maybe more extensively than you wanted. I'll continue a search for other DACs that hit this milestone. This process hopefully will find some successful lower-priced offerings, which might include Berkeley's less-than-half-priced Alpha DAC Series 3. And I hope, even if this necessitates higher prices, to find some DACs that make further meaningful progress. I hope you've enjoyed this review of the Berkeley Audio Systems Alpha DAC Reference Series 3 with the accompanying Alpha USB Series 2. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you again soon.